Yeah, whenever we sing a, a psalm, I, I can't help but think of the many, many Christians throughout the years, uh, throughout Christendom, who have sang that song hundreds of years ago, all the various things that are going on throughout the, the church and in the world, and uh, we're joining our voices, singing a, a similar song, a same song, the same lyrics put to music that, uh, that they had sung many, many years ago. It's a wonderful thing to be part of such a, a long Christian heritage. Um, you can open up your Bibles to the book of Mark, specifically to Mark 14. We're going to jump back into this series. And uh, if I seem excited to preach, it's because I've been off for a couple of weeks, and I am. So buckle up. We'll be here a little while. We're going to take a bit of a running start at the text here. So just to remind ourselves, the book of Mark is all about Jesus, who is the promised king, and he is ushering in his kingdom. And at the height of his popularity, he enters Jerusalem to a large crowd which was big enough that the religious establishment feared that crowd, and they welcomed him as the Messianic king. Now, reminder that Jerusalem would have been full of hundreds of thousands of extra visitors during this time because it was Passover. And during that time when the city is bustling, Jesus comes in and he cleanses the temple. He cleanses it of its corruption He calls out its hypocrisy, he openly embarrasses the religious leaders, and he prophesied that the temple was going to be destroyed along with all of its corruption, and with it would come the end of the old covenant age. So Jesus has come into Jerusalem, and he's made a stir. Jesus celebrates the Passover with his disciples, reminder that that was on the 14th of Nisan, which was the Thursday of Passion Week, and that was the Galilean custom. And then he took them to the Garden of Gethsemane where he was betrayed by Judas and arrested. And that's where we last left the story. So we're going to pick it up in verse 53 of Mark 14. And just before we turn to God's word, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, we pray that you would speak to us from it. And Lord, that we would attune our hearts to hear your voice as it speaks to us through your written revelation to us. I pray, Lord, that we would transition now in our minds by worshiping you through songs that we're singing to the hearing and the understanding and the preaching of your word. I pray that your spirit would be here not only empowering what I say, but helping all of us to understand and apply the truth of your word to our very lives. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer, and I pray that you would guard my lips against saying anything that is not true of you or true of your word, that you might be glorified in the preaching of the word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So Mark chapter 14, I'm going to start in verse 53. And they led Jesus to the high priest... And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none." For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent, and he made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garment and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death, and some began to spit on him and cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. That's the word of the Lord to us this morning. And there's a couple things that I want to say right off the get-go. We're entering into a very familiar part of the gospel narrative. 
right? If, if you've been in church at any length of time, every Easter, you're going to get crucifixion messages. You're going to hear about Passion Week. You're going to hear about the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. So these are familiar stories to us. But what I want us to pick up is that this is coming at the end of a narrative, right? I want you to guard your minds from compartmentalizing these parts of, of Jesus' life and of the narrative from everything that we've heard before, everything that we've learned in our year through the book of Mark. Second thing I want to note is that in order to kind of pull out everything out of this text that I think we can today, I think we need to go through just a little bit of history. And part of that is the law of God that was given to Israel is important for us to understand because as we're going through this trial I want to show you what a miscarriage of justice this entire sham trial was. The sermon title today is Cosmic Injustice and in order to understand how grievous the injustice that was done to Jesus was we have to understand the justice that God called his people Israel and by extension us too. So one of the reasons that God gave his law to Israel was so that it would be a just society. Deuteronomy 16, starting in verse 18, Deuteronomy 16, starting in verse 18 says, you shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment You shall not pervert justice, you shall not show partiality, and you shall not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice, and only justice, you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving to you. And part of the reason that God wanted Israel to be a just society is because he knew that the other nations that were being led astray by their false gods, did not have a standard of justice that reflected the character of a good and loving creator. So he gave his law, which reflects his character, to Israel in order that the nations around him would look at them and say, what just society is this and what God is over them that gives them such just laws? So that was the reason that God gave his people the law. So Israel was to have a system of law and a system of courts and of judges and court officials and prosecutors and defenders who would be able to maintain justice. So by the time we come to the life of Jesus, we actually have enough historical information to to know how they implemented these laws, these Old Testament laws, in order to try to be that just society that God called them to be. So what was going on in the day of Jesus is that the law was applied in every locality through the synagogues, which were in nearly every town. And so when you're reading the gospel accounts or you're reading the book of Acts and you're reading about them going to the synagogue, the synagogues are not only a place of learning, but they're also outposts of justice. If a town had at least 120 men, which represented 120 households, they would have a local court called the Sanhedrin, which literally means seated together. And the Sanhedrin would be composed of 23 men, always an even number, 23 men, so that there was never a stalemate. And those 23 men that made up the Sanhedrin that was in every community that had at least 120 households, those 23 men, they made up a court in any place, and they were called the city elders. They sat as judges of that court and in that city and town. One of them was designated a ruler. So when scripture often talks about a ruler of such and such a place, it's not necessarily talking about a monarch or a king. It's talking about the the leader of the Sanhedrin, which was the localized court in that particular town. So when Jesus is going through and he's coming to Capernaum and he's coming to all of these various places, he's coming to places that would have a Sanhedrin, a court of 23 men who would represent the at least 120 households in that region and would uphold justice in that region. So if there were disputes, then those, let's say there were disputes between neighbors about the, the borders of their land or, or one person's dog attacks somebody's ox, then they would go to the Sanhedrin and these 23 men would render a decision. So these councils or courts were essentially responsible for governing every community. 
They were the ones who made decisions about legal matters of every kind. Jerusalem had the sort of supreme court, the great Sanhedrin, and that was 70 men plus one, which was the high priest. And they not only governed the affairs of Jerusalem proper, but also acted as a sort of higher court of appeal to these lower courts and all these other jurisdictions. So there's a few little interesting tidbits, and I'll tell you why we're going through all of this. So all trials, this is just some information about what was going on in sort of the justice system in Israel during the time of Jesus. All trials had to be public and all trials had to provide both a prosecution and a defense. So the whole whole modern justice system that we have now where you are entitled to a defense is coming out of the practical application of God's law. Defense attorneys are a practical application of God's law because everybody was to be represented. There could be no accusation that would be accepted. So each of these councils of 23 men, a case would not be heard against anyone if there wasn't at least two or three witnesses that could bring uh, the, the uh, accused uh, accusation. Deuteronomy, 29, or, sorry, Deuteronomy 19 says, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses shall a charge be established. Also, false witnessing was a very serious crime. We would call it perjury today, but that also comes from God's law. Listen to Deuteronomy 19, verse 16. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests, and before the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, listen to this, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother." So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit any such evil among you. So according to God's law, if somebody bears false witness in court in front of these judges because the system is supposed to be just, then the person who bears false witness, the person who lies and gives a wrong account, would receive the punishment that the person that they were falsely accusing would have gotten. So if you falsely accuse your brother of murder and you lie on the witness stand about that, then you would receive the death penalty because that was the punishment that you were seeking for the person that you were lying about. That's how God's law works. And notice the reason. It says, you shall purge the evil from your midst and the rest shall hear and fear and shall never again commit any such evil among you. So God's law was to create a just society, and by the time Jesus comes around, this is how these laws were put in place. So if the decision was a death penalty, this is really interesting, then 24-hour time had to pass before the execution, no more and no less. And this was to protect against reactionary mob justice, but it would also not require the state to pay for an incarcerated individual who is condemned to death to wait months and months and even years on end. Also, witnesses whose testimony determined guilt were required to inflict the first blows of execution. The, the form of execution in that day was stoning, and so those whose testimony condemned someone to death would have had to throw the first stones kind of gives extra meaning when Jesus is looking at the woman who is caught in adultery and he says, who among you is going to throw the first stone, right? Who's the witness? Who's the witness who saw this? None of them were willing to throw the first stone. Why? Because they knew if they were to bear false witness against her, then they would be guilty or they would, uh, could incur the exact punishment that they were seeking for her. Uh, No criminal could be tried at night. No criminal could be tried through the night when it began during the day. Judges had to fast. This is really interesting. During the time of Jesus, judges had to fast through the trial in order to take their responsibility seriously. Isn't that a great application? Trials were never allowed on a Sabbath, never allowed on a feast day such as Passover, and never allowed on the day before a feast day. So having said all of that, the question you might be asking is, well, that's great. I love the information you bring, Pastor, but what does that have to do with our text today? As we delve into the text today, I want you to understand that every single one of those laws was broken in the trial of Jesus. 
So, so the, the trial of Jesus that was supposed to be done at the hands of the religious leaders who were entrusted with a, the laws that would create a just society acted unjustly and broke every single one of their own laws in order to condemn Jesus. So what's happening in the text? Here's the first point. The religious authorities violate every aspect of God's law to unjustly condemn Jesus to death. The religious authorities violate every aspect of God's law to unjustly condemn Jesus to death. So after giving you all that history and their standards of justice, you can see how the Jewish trial of Jesus violated all of those laws. It violated all principles of justice and perpetrated the greatest miscarriage of justice that the world had ever seen. It was illegal from the beginning to the end and in every possible way. Now, it's interesting, this is just, there, there's a Jewish trial and then there was a Gentile trial, which would have needed to happen in those days because the Jews were occupied and under Roman rule. So there would have had to be both a Jewish trial and a Roman trial. The Jewish trial had three different phases and the Gentile trial had three different phases. So six times Jesus stood before a judge or judges and six different times in a period of less than five hours. I want you to understand that. Right? Everything that we just talked about in terms of taking your time, acting justly, not doing trials at night, not letting them go through the night, all of this was so that people could think through. Judges were supposed to fast through the trials. All of these various things because justice was important. And so all of this, Jesus stood before six different times, stood before judges in less than five hours in the dead of night. And all the phases of the trial were accelerated in the few hours ending just after dawn on Friday morning. So all of these six um, moments where Jesus stands before judges that happened in a five-hour span, that five-hour span comes to an end just before dawn on Friday morning, which means that this entire trial took place during the dead hours of the night. And I want you to understand that because I I think sometimes, and I've heard preachers say this, I've heard Christians say this, where they say, look at the fickle hearts of those in Jerusalem. One moment they're crying, you know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and welcoming Jesus as the Messiah. And the next moment they're crying, crucify him at the trial. I, I don't think there's any scriptural warrant to believe that those are the same crowds. That one crowd and a large crowd that the religious leaders um, feared That large crowd welcomed Jesus, loved Jesus, loved what he was doing, loved that he was challenging the authority, praised him as the messianic king. But while that crowd slept in the wee hours of Thursday evening, those who hated Jesus rushed through a sham trial so that when everybody is waking up dawn on Friday morning, Jesus is hanging on a cross. We can start with the fact that the verdict was in before the procedure began. You can look at, uh, at verse 55. It says, now the chief priests and the whole council, I want you to hold that in your mind for a moment, whole council, just hold that phrase in your mind. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. What were they not seeking? The truth. What were they seeking? A reason to put him to death. The verdict was in, they were looking for the evidence that would get them the ends that they were looking. They were not seeking justice. They were seeking an excuse to kill Jesus. They've come together already in the middle of the night because Judas got them together to point out where he was. They've been to the garden. They have him under arrest, and now they've got to come up with some reason to execute him. Now, Matthew and Mark give us the record of his main trial before the Sanhedrin. That's what we just read in our text today. Um, But interestingly, John 18 has some details about what happens first that Mark and Matthew don't necessarily look at. In John 18, you can either go there, you can just jot this down, but John 18, starting in verse 12, it says, So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. So interestingly, Mark's uh, Mark's, uh, account takes us right to the Sanhedrin trial, but John tells us that first they went to the house of Annas, 
who is the father-in-law of the high priest. And you might ask the question if you're going through this, right? Asking questions of the text helps us understand what's going on. Why Annas? Why would they take him to the father-in-law of the high priest? Doesn't that seem a little bit odd? Well, historically, Annas had been the high priest for about six years, almost two decades prior. The Romans had forced him to step down from the office of high priest. We're not quite sure historically why, but the next five high priests, just think about this, right? I know that we have a congregation that's pretty attuned to uh, political corruption, (laughs) So let me just think about this. Just think about this for a minute. So Caiaphas is forced to step down from the, by the Romans about 20 years ago after six years of being the high priest. The next five high priests, including Caiaphas, are all his sons and sons-in-law. Seem like a little bit of a conflict of interest? So they're all sons or sons-in-law of Annas, and now Caiaphas, who was his son-in-law, was the high priest. In other words, Annas was sort of behind the scenes orchestrating everything. He and his sons had passed on this power to, uh, to sequential people in the family, and thus they had solidified that power and become very rich and very powerful in Israel. Jesus had attacked the very heart of their operation when he cleansed the temple, and that's why they took him to Annas first, because he was the guy behind the, string, behind the scenes pulling the puppet strings. So you can keep going, you can jump down in John 18 to verse 19, and there it says, the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. Now just as a... As a uh, it, this is still uh, against the law, what, what Annas is doing, still to this day, right? He's looking for Jesus to self-incriminate. He's saying, just talk to me. This is, this, is why, this is why if you ever watch any law shows, the lawyer comes and he says, why are you talking to my client when I'm not present, right? They always say that. And, and the reason is, is because you cannot self-incriminate you. And so there's, there's laws against you actually looking for, just tell me about, if you have no evidence they can't come in and question you and just simply ask unless they, unless they have evidence that would give them reason to ask you the specific questions that they're asking. So Caiaphas is here and he's just, tell me what you've been teaching. He's looking for something that Jesus will self-incriminate. But not only that, look at Jesus. What's his response? Go ask some people. Go find witnesses against me. I'm not gonna self-incriminate. Why do you ask me this? Ask those who have heard me and what I said to them. Um, he says, right, and I've, I've said nothing in secret. Verse 22, when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Now, I just want you to think again, because I, I know we have in our minds this idea that Jesus is this, this timid little lamb that never responds and never lashes out and never, I, I, he doesn't lash out. He's completely in control the whole time. But look at verse 23. Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Jesus didn't take this all lying down. He knew justice because he is the law of God. Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And that's where our text picks up the story. So as a point of application here, this is how an innocent man acts. Just as a point of application, I want you to see, this is how an innocent man acts. This is how a righteous man acts. He's steadfast, he's immovable, he's full of integrity, and he has an unyielding strength to him. Right? They're questioning him. He's not getting defensive. He doesn't feel like he has to defend himself. He's standing there silently and saying, what I've said, I've said in public. I haven't said it in secret. Go ask them. Even when he's struck, he doesn't just take it. What does he do? He says, why are you striking me? Did I say something wrong? Right? In other words, he's, he's holding them responsible for their actions here. Jesus has no defense, no public audience, no witnesses against him, and Annas is trying to get Jesus to self-incriminate, breaking all of the standards of justice that God had given them in his law. So the trial moves to the house of Caiaphas, and back to Mark 14, if you're following back and forth in your text, back to Mark 14, verse 56, it says, many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him. They can't pin him down, They have nothing on him. And as a side note, can I tell you why so few people are courageous in the face of corrupt power? 
just as a side note, because I want, you to, I want you to see the character and the power of Jesus here. Do you, do you know why so few people are actually courageous in the face of corrupt power? Because they're actually guilty. Because they have guilt, because they have shame, because they're afraid that the, the things they know that they've done wrong are going to come to the surface. Men of integrity who are innocent are fearless in the face of corrupt power because they know that they got nothing on them. And that's what we see in Jesus. So they got nothing on him. The witnesses, the false witnesses can't even agree. So how is it that Jesus ends up on a cross? Here's the second point. Jesus testifies against himself in order to accomplish the will of his father. Jesus testifies against himself in order to accomplish the will of his father. I want you to see this. So just like I said to you um, last time I preached on this, in the garden, Jesus let them arrest him, right? He says, who are you looking for? Jesus, I am. They all fall to the ground. And as they scramble to their feet, he's like, sure, now you can take me. Now that you know that I can knock you down with my words, you can arrest me. Well, here, the false witnesses run in circles Hours are going by, the false witnesses can't agree, they have nothing to pin Jesus down with, so what happens? He testifies against himself. So this sham trial is going on, it's full of false witnesses who will not be punished for their perjury, by the way. It's dragging on because the bad guys have nothing on our hero until, look at verse 61. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ? the son of the blessed. And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garment and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. What just happened? Well, Jesus testified against himself. They couldn't condemn him, so he condemned himself. See, there's two things that are happening right here. It was a crime, a blasphemous crime, to use the proper name of God anywhere but the temple in Jerusalem. So during the time of the exile, when the people were scattered around, particularly in Babylon, but were, when the people of God were scattered in the exile, they developed a law, they developed a, a rabbinical law that would say, we're not going to use the proper name of God in these pagan nations so that they won't discover who our God is. Now, it's interesting, right? Because the Israelites were supposed to be an evangelistic people, and yet this tradition came up. And so even to this day, if you notice, if you're ever around a, an Orthodox Jew, they will not use the proper name of God. They won't use the name Yahweh. It's actually why in our scriptures, and I think it's a tragedy in our English languages, by the way, that the word, the proper name of God, Yahweh, is translated as Lord. When you read it in the Bible, it's L-O-R-D, when it's all capitalized, is, is when it's using the proper name of God. But we as Christians, we ought to know and love and use the name Yahweh. That's his personal name. That's the personal name of God. And because we are in right standing with him, we can use the name Yahweh without any sort of reprisal. But it was, it was unlawful for them to use it. So Jesus does two things in his testimony against himself. First of all, he uses again the Greek, ego e me, I am, right, declaring himself to be God. And then when it says, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, it's a bad English translation, what he says is you will see me seated at the right hand of Yahweh. So he's using the proper name of God and he's declaring himself to be the I am and the high priest can't take it. He tears his clothes and he says it's blasphemy. See, they couldn't find anything on him. They could not get him on any of these charges because he was innocent. But Jesus hands himself over to them by testifying against himself. And you might ask the question, why would Jesus do this? I mean, we know the Sunday school answer because he had to go to the cross. But why would Jesus do this? Let's put it in the context of what we've seen in the book of Mark. Because in the garden, though Jesus was tempted to abandon his mission, remember he asked for the cup to be removed from him. God, he says, Father, if we can do this any other way, take this cup from me. Let's not do it this way. And when he asks that, the answer that Jesus received from his father was no, 
do it this way. And so because Jesus, in his prayer, can we do it another way, received the answer from his father, no, this is the way it must be done, Jesus knew he had to go to the cross. And so he condemns himself in front of the Sanhedrin court. John, John 6, verse 38 says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus didn't come to do his own will. He came to do the will of the Father. And so Jesus testifies against himself in order to accomplish the will of the Father. Jesus came to lay his life down as a ransom for many and to die as the Passover lamb and to make sure that this happened as it was ordained by the Father and Jesus needed to offer himself up. And that leads us to our big idea, the thing that I think this text is getting at. The big idea is this. Jesus gives up his own life to redeem the sinners and the system that condemned him. Jesus gives up his own life to redeem the sinners and the system that condemned him. Now, over the next couple of weeks, there's a verse that I want you to hold in your mind, right? This is the, the series is the lion and the lamb. And we have a temptation to only see the lamb of God that's offered up meekly during the crucifixion narrative. I want you to see the lion here. John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. I want you to hold them in your minds over the next couple of weeks. For this reason, this is Jesus speaking, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. Listen to this. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I've received from my Father. Everything we're about to see, all of the mistreatment, all of the whipping, the scourging, the crown of thorns, the mockery, all of it. It happened not because Jesus was meek and mild and was the victim, but it happened because Jesus chose to step into that role and allow himself to receive all of that punishment so that you and I don't have to. That's an amazing thing. I have the authority to lay down my life and I have the authority to pick it back up again, he says. So Jesus gave up his life. It wasn't taken from him. And like we saw when we studied the previous verses in Gethsemane, Jesus used the Greek ego emi, I am, and he knocks everyone down before letting himself be bound and arrested. Here, Jesus knows the injustice, knows they cannot successfully condemn him, knows the shortcuts and the sham trial that it is, and yet he gives himself up not for his benefit, but for ours. And you might be tempted to kind of squabble at my wording there, redeem the sinners that condemned him. You might, you might because obviously he, he died for us as sinners, but what about the sinners that condemned him? And this is such a cool thing. We'll get to this near the end of Mark, but in Mark 15, verse 43, it says, Joseph of Arimathea, and then who is Joseph of Arimathea? Look at Mark 15, 43. Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Luke renders it this way in Luke 23. It says in verse 50, Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. So Joseph of Arimathea was a Sanhedrin member in Jerusalem. He was an upholder of justice. This whole thing happened under his watch. And as good as it is that Luke tells us that he was a good man who didn't consent to the actions of the council, he also didn't stop it. History is littered with good men who knew the right thing to do but didn't have the courage to do it. There were a lot of good men, good pastors and good elders who knew the right thing to do during COVID but still shut down their churches and surrendered headship of the church to Caesar. But here's the good news. Jesus died for Joseph of Arimathea. 
the man who is too cowardly to stop the injustice. Jesus died for Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus died for Peter, who denied him three times. Jesus died for Paul, who put believers to death before his conversion. He died for sinners like you, and he died for sinners like me. And so, Jesus gave up his own life to redeem the sinners and the system that condemned him. Because as you look at the standards of justice in God's law, what Jesus wanted to do was restore it. What Jesus wanted to do was restore all of creation. That includes the physical world. That includes the sinners that are bound to sin. And that includes the sin that has corrupt every aspect of political life, cultural life, social life. God came to re- Christ came to redeem all of it. And his se- substitutionary death was enough to save not only sinners, but also the system that condemned him. And so here's some implications for our Christian life, sort of application to finish us off. And the first is this. Implications for the Christian life. Number one, Jesus came to save more than just souls. He didn't come to save less than souls, but he did come to save more than souls. The salvation of individual sinners is absolutely crucial and the foundation of all cultural transformation. But individuals getting right with God happens one way through the completed work of Jesus, being believed and trusted in for total salvation. But we must also remember that peace with God brings actual transformational blessing. Okay, I'll say that again because I don't think we all understand that. I don't think that the, that the North American evangelicalism puts this as part of their gospel understanding. The gospel gets sinners saved. Yes, it gets you a access to heaven. Yes, but more than that, peace with God brings transformational blessing. Changed individuals change their families, their churches, their neighborhoods, their businesses, their communities, and eventually nations. Our justice system needs transformation. Our tax system needs transformation. Our medical and educational systems, our society needs to be reshaped. And make no mistake, only the Spirit of God can reshape these things. But the practical tool that regenerate people use to transform the world around them is God's law, right? Let me say that one more time because what I'm not saying is that God's law transforms individuals. I'm not saying that. The Spirit of God is the only thing that can reshape individuals, but the practical tool that regenerate people use to transform the world around them is obedience to God's law. And so God came to save more than just souls. He came to redeem sinners and to give transformed sinners the task of reshaping the world around them. Second implication is this. Christians should follow Jesus in giving up their lives for the benefit of others. One of the things that you'll see over and over as we work our way through the crucifixion narrative, and you see it nowhere stronger than right here, as Jesus, full of the, uh, r- surrounded by the injustices around him, could have walked away scot-free. I, I love the, um, I love, uh, there's an old phrase by uh, um, Greg Bonson. He says, give an atheist enough rope and eventually he'll hang himself. And, and, it's, and it looks like that, right? That's the idea is that there, it's a walking contradiction to deny the living God. And here you see Jesus as he's just standing back silent You see testimonies of false witnesses that are disagreeing with one another. They're not getting anywhere. If he had to just let them be, they would have hung themselves with the amount of rope he was giving them. But he steps in and he condemns himself, testifies against himself. Why? Because he was giving up his life for the benefit of others. And Christians should follow Jesus in giving up our lives for the benefit of others. We're learning through this series to be more like Jesus There are times that we are to be ferocious lions, confronting evil, exposing hypocrisy, defending the defenseless, fighting sin. But there are also times that we are to be a meek lamb, showing patience when we are sinned against, forgiving our enemies, absorbing offense instead of harboring bitterness, and this greatest lesson, laying down our lives for the benefit of others. Giving up your own wants, needs, desires, in order to be a blessing to others. 
There's a powerful verse that if we would let this verse sink into our hearts, it would radically transform each and every one of our lives. John 12, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Unless, unless we are willing to die, unless we are willing to give up ourselves, we cannot bear fruit. Unless, that word says, it's just not possible for us to bear fruit unless we're willing to give up our lives for the benefit of others. So let's be like our Savior. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we love your word. And Lord, we love our Savior. We thank you, Lord, that he week after week models to us what it looks like to be obedient to the Father. I pray, Lord, that you would help us. Help us to first and foremost be grateful that Jesus came and in the midst of all of that injustice gave up his own life that we could be reconciled to you. Lord, for each and every person who is here who believes that and has placed faith in you, I pray, Lord, that you would bolster us and that you would help us as regenerate people with a new heart within us who are with a spirit that causes us to walk in your ways. May we be a transformational agent in the world around us. And Lord, for each and every person who is here who has not yet believed this story, who has not bent the knee to King Jesus, may they see today and throughout the rest of this series as we look at Jesus on trial, Jesus giving up his own life, Jesus on the cross, may they come to understand that he died in our place. That was a death that we deserve to die, a death that we rightly should die. Have experienced, but instead Jesus took our place, took our sin upon himself, and nailed it to the cross that we might be freed from our sins, might place faith in Jesus, and live everlastingly with you. We pray, Lord, that that gospel would be what not only fuels this church, but in every individual in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.